being co-hosted by the Institute of Chinese Studies and Vishnu Bharati University in partnership with the India Office of Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. The AICCS process commenced in 2006, and since then it has expanded into an annual gathering, bringing together China scholars from all over India. Each year, it is organized by the ICS in partnership with the leading university or research center. This model takes China studies to all parts of the country and encourages scholars to intermingle, share ideas, and learn from each other. Due to the constraints of the COVID pandemic, we're meeting in the virtual mode this year. The ICS is privileged to host the 14th AICCS in collaboration with the Vishnu Bharati University Shanti Niketan, which was founded by Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore in 1921. Vishnu Bharati is celebrating a centenary this year, and it's particularly appropriate that we have teamed up to organize the AICCS. Vishnu Bharati is a leading educational institution of the country, and China Bhavan has played a pioneering role in promoting China studies and in nurturing cultural and civilizational links between India and China. We are indebted to Vice Chancellor Prof. Vidyut Chakrabarti for his support, and I welcome him amidst us. I would also like to put on record our deep appreciation for the role and contribution of Prof. Abhijit Banerjee and his colleagues at China Bhavan. I also wish to thank the India Office of Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for collaborating with us in organizing this conference, and I welcome its dynamic country head for India, Mr. Peter Remele. I must make a special mention of the role of Professor Sobri Mitra, convener of the 14th AICCS, and my other colleagues at the, at, at the ICS for the meticulous and painstaking work in putting together this conference. Friends, the Institute of Chinese Studies is now in its 52nd year, having commenced in 1969 as the China Study Group. Over these years, the ICS has gradually carved out a niche for itself as a vibrant research institute committed to promoting interdisciplinary research on China and East Asia as a meaningful platform to generate public discourse on this region of great significance to us as an active forum which brings together China scholars as a catalyst to nurture China studies in India and contribute to capacity building. Our Wednesday seminars have been conducted without interruption for over 50 years now. Our peer reviewed quarterly journal, China Report, is in its 56th year of publication and indexed in 14 databases globally. Our many flagship events and activities, including the AICCS, the India Forum on China at Goa, ICS Harvard Yanqing Institute Scholarship, internship program, numerous publications and academic linkages with institutions in India and abroad have enriched China studies in India. The digital outreach of the Institute has expanded significantly in the COVID period. We take particular pride in one special feature of AICCS. Apart from the participation of established scholars the conference provides a platform to young scholars from all over the country to present papers based on their ongoing research. We had excellent response to a call for papers this year, receiving about 150 abstracts. There's another aspect of this conference that I would like to highlight. We have made special efforts to reinforce the representative and all India character of the AICCS. We are particularly pleased that scholars of over 40 institutions from India and abroad are presenting papers and speaking at this conference. It's honor for us that the keynote address today is being delivered by Ambassador Shushankar Menon, visiting professor of Ashoka University, chairman of the advisory board of the ICS, former national security advisor and foreign secretary, and a leading diplomat and foreign policy thinker of the country. He has made an outstanding contribution to the shaping of foreign and national security policies of India, but his long experience of engagement with China is of particular significance. He is a highly respected China scholar. 
we will be speaking today on internal drivers of china's external behavior i welcome him amidst us friends as we commence our deliberations today we must remind ourselves how important it is to understand correctly what is happening in china its actions abroad adopting an evidence based approach and avoiding stereotypes the rise of china is the most important geopolitical development of the past quarter century but china is also a country at an inflection point economically politically diplomatically and militarily it's undergoing multiple transitions with uncertain outcomes the covid pandemic has accelerated these trends there is also evidence of inward turn by china with its zero covid policy china has drastically curtailed person to person interactions with the outside world since early last year and the situation is not likely to change any time soon today china is seen as a leading strategic challenge for many parts of the world and more so for india given that it is our largest neighbor with which our relationship has been complex and is even more so now a nuanced approach to china is the need of the r especially as we see great power equations changing and an acute contestation for strategic space in various geographies taking place for india the incidents the border making it a live border after decades of peaceful management as also structural challenges have reset the relationship there are numerous issues in our relationship with china emanating from our respective trajectories priorities concerns and aspirations often rooted in our histories socio political systems and government models therefore we must have a holistic understanding of history culture society economy politics and international relations of china and of india china relations we must continue to forge an indian perspective of china studies friends with a new generation of china scholars actively contributing we are at a turning point in the development of china studies in india it's encouraging to note that over the last decade or so china studies have been expanding in the country many public and private universities have have been established have established china studies program and new centers teaching chinese language have come up yet we are conscious of the huge deficit that confronts us the challenges that face us including the constraints of funds talent language deficiency and low engagement outside of india friends the 14th aiccs carries forward the efforts to bring together china scholars exchange ideas on china studies and deliberate on the emerging areas of research let me welcome all speakers panelists discussants and other participants who will share the wisdom and knowledge over the next 3 days i would like to particularly welcome young scholars who will presenting their papers i welcome all of you thank you very much thank you ambassador kanta let me now invite mr peter rumeli res resident representative to india conrad adams system to for his remark over to you sir thank you your excellencies ladies and gentlemen first of all i'd like to thank the institute of china studies and the china bhavana vishwa bharata university for organizing this event in partnership with us the india office of the konrad adenauer stiftung i'd also like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the experts especially the young young ones as well from around the world who will participate in this conference and who will undoubtedly broaden our horizons with their knowledge and insights china has a rich history and is associated with several of the world's most influential dynasties chinese culture dates back several thousands of years its influence can be found all over the world in other parts of asia in parts of america and even in europe for example everywhere in the world we eat from china and of course i'm not meaning their food but the synonym for porcelain therefore instead of talking at nauseam on the current geostrategic and geoeconomic aggression of china allow me to address a topic of great current relevance 
which underlies several panels that are now to follow over the duration of the 14th All India Conference of China Studies. My remarks will be devoted to the rise of neo-nationalism in contemporary China under the leadership of Xi Jinping, a process that has been shaped by changes in the middle empire society and culture and is being observed keenly and with great disquiet by Western and India, China scholars alike. What we now refer to as Chinese nationalism has emerged from various ideological sources, including traditional Chinese Confucianism, Marxism, and Western liberalism. It has been influenced by internal and external actors, wars, civil wars, relations with Western countries, leaders and intellectuals, all have played a role in the development of Chinese nationalism. Even though China has a history dating back thousands of years, Chinese nationalism is a relatively new phenomenon that has emerged through what the CCP leadership and indeed the majority of Chinese people refer to as the century of humiliation. This century of humiliation is commonly known as the period of intervention and subjugation of the Qing dynasty and the Republic of China by Western powers and Japan from 1839 to 1949. Before this time, the Chinese considered themselves the center of the universe and foreigners barbarians. And what we know today as China did not exist at the present nation as the present nation had neither an official name nor a true national flag, nor did it have any of the elements that normally symbolize a nation state. It was the famous Chinese intellectual Lin Kui Chao who wrote during the late Qing dynasty, nothing shames me more than the fact that our nation has no name. Against the backdrop of sweeping defeat, the Chinese elites began to develop a mentality of saving the Chinese and the rich nation and strong army among the population, which paved the way for the concept of nationalism taking root in the contemporary China for the first time in the long history of the Middle Empire. During the 19th century, that's the time of the Opium Wars, the image of China in the West was entirely negative. And therefore in the Western imagination, it was the breeding ground for all evil, a place of darkened conspiracy against the world or in simple terms, the yellow danger. And thus the base for political actions towards China. I'm even remembering that the German emperor, William II, he called upon all powers with united forces to defend the, what he called most holy goods, whatever they were, against the imagined aggression from the East. If today's China is continuing its current path, this described view of China might see a revival, with the only difference that this time the aggressions are not imagination. In the decades, Somebody suddenly has muted me. So again, in the decades that followed, nationalism took various often contradictory forms from a centralist state-controlled form of nationalism under Mao's leadership to a more pro-Western liberal nationalism when there seemed to be a desire in China to learn from the West from 1976 to 1989. This phase of nationalism came to a bloody and abrupt end with the Tiananmen Square massacre which gave rise to an anti-Western pragmatic nationalism that was followed by a form of cyber nationalism in the early 2000s, when the internet became the key means of expression for the so-called generation Y, born into a consumerist culture. Today's nationalism under the leadership of Xi Jinping, which emerged from history, from this history I described, seems to be an all-encompassing with nothing too big or too small for the Chinese state to exert control over. This was demonstrated, for example, when the launch of a new Sony product in China was heavily fined by the Chinese authorities because it coincided with the anniversary of the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937, 
which marked the Japanese invasion of China. As the CCP under the leadership of Xi Jinping embraces nationalism as a central source of legitimacy and unity, the CCP seems to also have come to the realization that economic growth cannot remain its primary source of legitimacy forever. Nationalism is also a crucial component of Xi Jinping's goal to transform China from a rich country somewhat back to when China was perceived as the center of the universe, a phase that is expected to last until the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China in 2049, when Xi Jinping's political campaign of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, as the leader himself had announced it, will come to an end. So the most important task for him and the CCP, therefore, is to restore past glory and thus realize the dream of a great power nation. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this brief excursion of the history of nationalism in China has illustrated one crucial point to you. One cannot comprehensively interpret and understand the present day CCP's actions, policies, and ideology without first examining the history, society, and culture of the Red Dragon. And this is exactly what I wish from this conference, that the experts here present will disentangle the historical, cultural, and social threads that guide present day China. However, looking at the list of experts who will be present during these three days, I'm more than sure that this conference will do just that, and I guess much more. I shall leave you with a quote from Confucius, who once said, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. In this spirit, may this conference broaden our ignorance and lead us to real knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rumeli. Uh, I would now invite Professor Bidyut Chakravarti, Vice Chancellor, Vishwabharati University, and former Professor of Political Science, University of Delhi, for the opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, Namaskar, Shiv Shankarji, Ashokji, Mr. Peter Rimle, Professor Sharbodi Mitra, my colleagues, my students and the fellow Chinese experts. Namaskar to all. It's a matter of great pleasure to be part of this conference. But my colleague, Professor Ovijit Banerjee knows that I prefer not to inaugurate the conferences generally. Because when you become vice chancellor, you are expected to inaugurate many conferences on areas in which he or she knows nothing. Still, you'll find the vice chancellor go there and they inaugurate the seminars or conferences by giving the impression that they have knowledge on these themes. As I, I quote uh, uh, Mr. Peter Rimler's last rem remark, that real knowledge is to understand one's limitations. I follow that rigidly. Now the question comes, why did I come to this conference to make opening remarks? There are spe specific reasons for this. That's why I got drawn to this conference as soon as Mr. Ashok Kanta sent an email to me and also Obhijit requested me to be present. I have, as I said, I have got very specific reasons. First of all, I consider China Bhavan to be a jewel in the crown of Vishwabharata. And there is a historical reason for this. The song which you heard a few minutes ago and the picture which you see behind us, I think are illustrative here. Because it was Rabindranath Tagore who always talks about togetherness. 
because he privileged humanity over anything else. So unlike many of our nationalist leaders, he never looked at the West to derive knowledge, to understand the discourses. He preferred to draw upon the ideas that flourished in the countries around India, because he believed that culturally, perhaps socially and politically, we are very close to the countries in our vicinity. So it would be better and perhaps judicious to be intellectually connected with these countries. And as you know, Gurudev visited China in 1924. And this particular bhavan or the department came into being in 1937 to show that Gurudev was keen to pursue Chinese studies in India with equal emphasis. And he invited one professor from China, Professor Tan Yun San, to begin this department, which I consider to be one of the best departments in the university. And we feel proud to be associated with the university, Vishwabharati, in which China Bhavan stands out. So that's one reason. The second reason is, you know, I have got a very personal connection with the theme which you have talked about, the Chinese studies. You know, I uh, wrote a book in 2011 on a theme called localizing governance. And I think, you know, while you deal with this theme, localizing governance, three important intellectuals who tried to indigenize public administration by focusing on the local context. The first one, of course, Gandhi. The second one, Julius Nyerere from Tanzania, who evolved the model of Ujama, and finally, Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong's idea of commune was very appealing to me as a model of localizing governance. And there I realized, you know, when I read Mao Zedong's approach to commune, I found out that he did not draw inspiration, not from Marx. You know, there is a misconception that well, while talking about commune, Mao Zedong depended a great deal on Karl Marx's explanation of the Paris Commune of 1871, which he you know, wrote extensively in his book called Civil War in France. But to my surprise, I found out after having read Mao Zedong's text that he derived inspiration for localizing governance, not from Karl Marx, but from a Chinese expert of the fourth century, Ka Ta Su. I may have got the pronunciation wrong, but it is called, in English it's called Ka Ta Su. So, you know, to me it's a revelation because we are talking about something which we thought was the product of British intellectual invention. You know, we refer to uh, uh, the, you know, the ideas of uh, British authority when they introduced local governments in India in the mid 19th century. Or we refer to English experts, um, Henry May, who wrote about republics in the East. But here I found a, a route which can be traced back to the fourth century. And a Chinese expert, Ata Sun, he developed this model, you know, localizing governments. And Mao Zedong recognized that in his text on this particular theme when he was developing the idea of communion. 
So you know, intellectually, I am drawn to Chinese history to some extent. I mean, I wish I could uh, speak Chinese, but you know, uh, that that is not possible probably at this age. But academically, I am quite impressed by the idea of Tata Sung, who evolved the notion of localizing governance as early as fourth century BC. So that's very interesting revelation to me when I worked on localizing governance. And the final uh, reason is that I visited China after I became vice chancellor of this university because we have got very intimate connection with the Chinese government. Bari, you know, the last two years when the relationship has reached a little, you know, uh, difficult phase. But we have got very intimate connection with the Chinese uh, authorities here in India and also authorities there in China. And we are welcome, you know, we are welcomed by them. We were taken as friends and while visiting some of the important cities in China, along with my colleague, Professor Obhijit Banerjee, I never found that it was a different country. And that reminds me of the idea which Tagore developed in the early 30s by saying that if you want to know about your neighbors, it is better to visit them, it is better to understand their socio-cultural life. So I think that was a source of knowledge for us, which is very close to our heart. Unlike his contemporary colleagues, Rabindranath Tagore always focused on what he derived from the neighbors around India. So I mean, these are the three important reasons for which I was quite interested to listen to the experts and the two speeches just before me, the speech by Sri Amal Kantaji and, and, Sri, uh, and, and Mr. Peter Rimley, you know, is very enlightening. And we must, you know, I, I also am reminded of another thing. You know, when I was growing as a college student in Calcutta Presidency College in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, you know that you are really enamored, you know, by the Chinese model of revolution, the, the so-called Naxalite movement. And I remember at that point of time, uh, picking re review, was a banned item. And I, I have uh, now no fear to disclose even before Shiv Shankarji that you know, we, uh, the students of Presidency College you know, knew where to go to read uh, Peking Review. Or you now it's called Beijing Review, Beijing Review. And you know, we used to read them and we used to listen to Chinese radio. You know, uh, and uh, every day in the evening, and uh, there was a bulletin on how Naxalism was developing in India. But you know, to my surprise, I, I didn't appreciate those bulletins because most of them were based on uncocked you know, ideas of the so-called uh, supporters of the Naxalite movement. So you know, that's why the difference started and we got dissociated from the campaign. But in the point which I'm trying to make that even at that point of time, we were quite inspired by the ideas of Mao Zedong. And as I said, the Red Book was something, a, a very precious you know, possession of all of us as students. Uh, Mao Zedong's collected works, you know, it was something if you had, you, know, you become one of the stars among the groups. So you know, the, the, these are the ideas I'm referring to simply to suggest that you know, there are some connection, you know, emotional connection between Indians and, and their Chinese counterparts. So that way, I think, you know, it is, it is always important for the scholars to go to the bottom of the issue, to understand the relationship between these two great nations, between these two great people, and also between these two great ingredients of humanity. You know, I, I emphasize this part again and again, because the more I study Rabindranath Tagore, 
the more impressed I am about his concern for humanity. And if you believe in humanity, this sort of you know, distinction uh, in terms of nationalism, for instance, doesn't hold good. So I think we should have this kind of conferences pretty often so that we can hear the new ideas you know, coming out of the young scholars, because we, are, we have become fossilized. You know? We keep on nurturing what we uh, learned earlier. So I'm really quite happy that um, uh, Institute of Chinese Studies um, and Vishwa Bharati have collaborated to make this happen. Because not only will it you know, enlighten me, not only will it introduce me to the new ideas, it will also provoke the young scholars to explore new areas of research. So that way this conference probably is a, is a strong signal to those who are interested in focusing on Chinese studies and having had the opportunity to listen to the experts, they will be really quite empowered to explore the unknown. So this is a very good you know, occasion for us to celebrate and I personally think, uh, personally thank uh, all the experts, including Shiv Shankarji, despite being busy, he uh, you know, agreed to give the keynote address. I'm really looking forward to listening to him. And I must appreciate the, the enthusiasm which uh, Sri Ashok Ji has expressed from the very beginning. Um, he was the one who I think was the source of inspiration for bringing all the scholars together, including me. I'm literally you know, lazy in this respect. But you know, I was quite impressed that Ashok Ji kept on sending me WhatsApp messages saying, please don't forget, you have to be there. And of course, I must thank my colleague, uh, Professor Obhijit Banerjee, because he's the one who is holding the flag high. And he's the one who is you know, sustaining the spirit in which Gurudev Raghunath Tagore started this particular bhavan. And I'm, I'm you know, persuading him not to leave this place because I'm told that there are other forces working outside Vishwarati to uh, draw him to those places. And so I keep on you know, asking him, please don't go. If you go away from this uh, the department, the department will collapse. You know, I, I, I mean it because after having worked with him for the last three years, and after having seen his you know, uh, language skill in China, and after having seen his, you know, the, uh, uh, the capacity to liaison with friends, I think he's the right person to head this department and he's the right person to have this kind of collaborative exercises. And I'm particularly happy because we are holding this conference during the year when Vishwabharat is celebrating his centenary year. And you know, I'm sure in the in the convocation address, our chancellor will certainly mention this because our chancellor, the honorable prime minister of the country, he is quite keen that we should develop you know collaboration with you know various universities across the world. So that way, I'm thankful to the organizer that they have accepted Vishwabharati as a partner, and I'm thankful to all of you that you know you have accepted me as one of the participants, despite the fact that I am not really associated with the uh, Chinese studies. With this, you know, I just you know, uh, uh, end uh, with a share that I have no doubt, just like Mr. Peter Rindler's statement, that this particular conference will be a great success. Because, let me explain this in terms of a Urdu share. Karam acha hai, karam acha hai to kismat dasi hai. Karam acha hai to kismat dasi hai. Niyat sahi hai, intent, niyat sahi hai to ghar madina kashi hai. Best of luck and I'm looking forward to listening to Shiv Shankar. Noshka. Thank you, Professor Shatulwarti. Thank you for your wishes and your support. Uh, since Professor Mitra is facing connectivity issues, I will now be reading out the convener's remarks by Professor Shabri Mitra, convener of the 14th AICCS, 
Professor, Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, wow. and Honorary Fellow, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, on her behalf. Rija, no, Shobri has just joined. Can she try if it's working? Sure, sure. Shobri, will you try? Go, go ahead, Rija, you go ahead. Okay. Professor Vidyut Chakravarti, Vice Chancellor of Vishwabharati University, Shantiniketan, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon, Visiting Professor of International Relations at Ashoka University, Chairman Advisory Board, Institute of Chinese Studies, and former National Security Advisor, Government of India, Mr. Peter Rumelli, Resident Representative of Conrad Adnath Stiftung to India, Ambassador Ashok Kantha, Director, Institute of Chinese Studies, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, Head of China Bhavan, Vishwabharati, Colleagues from academic institutions of India and abroad, young scholar participants, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from Team AICCS. As has been mentioned, All India Conference of China Studies, AICCS in short, is a flagship event of Institute of China Studies, held each year in collaboration with universities and institutions across India. The objective is to generate interest in and strengthen research on China studies. We have come a long way since the Institute had undertaken the first exercise of reviewing the state of China studies in India in 2006. Over time, this exercise has become institutionalized into an annual conference that showcases enduring and emerging themes in China studies, encourages interdisciplinarity, provides a platform for young scholars, and promotes active networking. In these years, the AICCS has traveled literally the length and breadth of India, collaborating with central and state universities such as Central University of Hyderabad, Banaras Hindi University, Jadhapur University, University of Mumbai, Goa University, pri private universities such as Christ University, OP Jindal Global University, and institutions such as I am Kori Code and I am Chennai. Most of these collaborations have gone beyond AICCS maturing into other, initi other initiatives and projects. This year, we have also received valuable support from the Conrad Atta Stiftung, which we hope will continue in the coming years. It is indeed a coincidence of great significance that the 14th AICCS has come to China Bhavan in the centenary year of Vishwa Bharati, just as the 5th AICCS was here in 2012 in the centenary year of the award of Literature Nobel to Rabindranath Tagore. While the special theme in the 5th AICCS was reinterpreting history, the special theme this year is society and culture in China. Visualized by Rabindranath Tagore and established by his Vishwakarma Professor Tan Yuan China Bhavan, after all, was the first seat of learning in modern India that engaged in research and teaching of Chinese language and culture, as well as India-China culture studies. In other words, it is here that it all began. Therefore, we felt it appropriate that we should have society and culture in China as a special theme, which has been the cool research interest of China Bhavan since its inception. I must mention that there were were two other events of monumental significance for which centenaries have been and are being observed that influenced our thought process as we were deciding on the special theme this year. The May 4th movement of 1919 and the establishment of the Communist Party of China in 1921, which combined together had deep and decisive impact on the Chinese conscious, consciousness in the last century and stimulated a process of comprehensive transformation of the Chinese people. Not to mention the fact that the social and cultural transformation of China have been of sustained interest to the world of academia, which has approached the subject with, with multiple perspectives and through debates and conversations. Apart from the special theme, the 14th AICCS has received individual abstracts and panel proposals on a wide range of China-related themes. Many of them are products of recent scholarship on conventional topics, while others have come to the fore in response to emerging issues of contemporary and critical relevance. For instance, the four special panels we have this year reflect diverse interests and concerns covering themes of international relations, social transformation, new cultural formations, and most obviously, a comparative study of how different countries dealt with the challenges of the COVID pandemic. Similarly, in the thematic panels, the issues covered are both exciting and enlightening, ranging from contemporary social and cultural manifestations to bilateral and multilateral economic interactions, 
to challenges of governance to historical linkages. We expect different components of China studies to be reshaped through interdisciplinary research and new niche areas to assume significance and claim scholarly attention. Finally, the keynote address by Ambassador Shivshankar Menon, the special lecture by Professor Frank P.K., and the validatory address by Professor Shichiyu will lay out the principles of how to observe and study China. When we started planning in March this year, we thought we will be holding the 14 AICCS in the serene and beautiful campus of Vishuddha Bharati in the iconic building of China. A few months down the line, it became clear that we have to opt for the virtual mode. But considering the enormous challenges all of us have faced in the last two years, we are fortunate to be here and looking forward to a rich harvest. I hope you will have an enriching experience in the 14th AICCS. Best wishes and thank you for your attention. Let me now extend a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Ambassador Shivshankar Menon, former security advisor to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and currently visiting professor of international relations at Ashoka University and chairman of the advisory board Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, for the keynote access. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rija. Uh, Ambassador Khan, uh, Dr. Rimele, Professor Bidyut Chakravarti, Professor Shabri Mitra, Professor Avijit Banerjee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this honor of speaking to the 14th All India China Studies Conference. And congratulations on having made this very welcome initiative a lasting and uh, feature of our lives since 2006. And I'm particularly happy, as previous speakers mentioned, to see so many good examples of scholarship on China by young Indian scholars in your proceedings. Uh, I thought that I would use this occasion to speak to you about an issue that has interested me for some time, about the internal drivers of China's external behavior. Uh, why? Why do, I, why do I think about this problem? For a decade or so, China's foreign behavior has actually managed to alienate or worsen relations with most of her neighbors with the exception of maybe Pakistan, Cambodia, possibly Russia. Uh, and she's embarked on a nuclear arms race, Wolf Warrior diplomacy, she's pressing hard on territorial disputes, changing the status quo. None of these seem likely to serve China, either in her rivalry with the US or to improve her relations in the neighborhood. So why has China followed a foreign policy course with predictable negative outcomes. I mean, the traditional explanations external to China, uh, which most IR people use, shifting international situation, China's changing global interests, great power rivalry, US pushback, these seem insufficient to explain the change or its timing. And I therefore thought it worth looking at whether domestic factors might be driving China's foreign policy to a greater extent or differently from the way it does in other parts. What I'm speaking about, I mean, the shift in Chinese behavior, external behavior, is more than just a matter of diplomatic style or of more assertive behavior by Chinese diplomats of offensive tweets, of prickliness at any perceived slight to the CCP or the PRC that, you know, people now call wolf warrior diplomacy. Today, Chinese diplomacy extends to seeking discourse power internationally, a desire to control the narrative on China, in China, and on the international stage, to the point where tweets by US basketball players are penalized. There are no Chinese villains in Hollywood movies for the last 15 years. Uh, China now demands loyalty, not only from her own citizens, but also from Chinese origin citizens of other countries diaspora. And the Chinese China dream is for the Chinese race, the Chunghua Minzu, which is translated and equated with the nation, not with citizens, with Kunmin. Uh, it, it extends this behavior to global order building through new institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
China centered global physical and virtual or digital connectivity through the Belt and Road Initiative and agenda setting in international and multilateral organizations. Four out of the 15 UN specialized agencies are now headed by PRC nationals. It includes a growing military presence abroad, military bases, Djibouti, Sihanoukville, potentially Gwadar, and the creation of a power projection capability, first in the near seas around China, and then towards Asian waters and maritime Asia, and finally globally. It has seen China weaponizing economic trade and other levers, even to the extent of hostage taking in response to the arrest in Canada of Meng Wanzhou, the CFO of Huawei and the daughter of its founder. In the last few years, she's imposed economic costs, trade boycotts on countries like Australia, Canada, South Korea, Philippines, Norway, Sweden. Uh, it remains to be proved that these actions did anything more than make China distrusted as a partner, or that they actually changed the behavior of the targeted country in a positive way. Uh, from China's point of view. And significantly for China's neighbors like India, China ch has chosen since 2008 to assert herself in disputes in her periphery and to use her power to change facts on the ground and at sea. And as a consequence, she is ringed in maritime Asia by disputes and hotspots which have flared up in the last decade or so, from the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands in the East China Sea, Taiwan, to Hong Kong, to the South China Sea, to the India-China border, and even to new territorial claims on Bhutan. Now, some of this can be explained as a direct response to the new security demands created by China's integration into the global economy and her export-led growth. Her turn to the oceans, her desire to secure the near seas are logical when for the first time in history, she faces no threat on land on her Eurasian frontiers. She now has assets abroad to protect, depends on the sea lanes for her food, her energy, commodities, exports, all essential to her economic well-being. And it's natural for her to seek to transition to becoming a maritime power for the first time in her history. But her choice of how to go about this task is still hard to explain, for me at least. For instance, rather than territorializing the South China Sea, militarizing it and declaring it a core interest, and thus a matter of sovereignty, making it a zero sum issue, why didn't China choose to work cooperatively with other powers and claimant states to ensure freedom of navigation and the safety and security of these sea lanes which are now of global significance. Just to be clear, it's not that domestic factors do not drive other or even all countries' foreign policies. But in China's case, they seem to have recently led China to follow external policies that no longer serve the goals that China claims to have set for her foreign policy, such as the community of common destiny or being center stage in the world. Uh, Sometimes I even wonder whether we're at a stage like the GPCR years when domestic politics override other external considerations uh, through a sort of shifted frame of reference. But I mean, that I think is an extreme problem. The proposition I would like to test on you is that in other parts, public opinion, populist politics drive external behavior. In China, regime survival and calculations of internal stability and economic growth seem to count for more in China's external behavior. It's not that China does not respond to domestic opinion or that Chinese leaders do not pursue populist policies. They do. But the pattern of China's internal politics and development has given a particular cast or shape to China's external behavior in the last decade. So let me suggest to you four factors that I think have shaped China's recent external behavior and that make it different from that of other powers. There must be others as well. I'm sure that you can think of those. First is her geography, which means that China cannot distinguish between internal and external issues as did previous hegemons, Great Britain and the US. Uh, 
when Xi Jinping announced the formation of the National Security Council in 2013, most of us assumed it would be like the US NSC. But there was a critical difference. The US NSC was formed to deal with an external threat, the Soviet Union, rich, secure, surrounded by three oceans, two harmless neighbors. The US could afford to distinguish between internal and external problems. China does not have that luxury. China is a country that has never taken its integrity for granted. It's ringed by potential foes. And her concept of national security must include both internal and external threats and the ways that the two can coalesce to bring down great China, which in historical terms has only recently been put together again. In his first speech to the NSC, which the Chinese now translate as a national security commission to distinguish it from its foreign counterparts, Xi Jinping said that the internal and external factors affecting national security had become more complicated. There must be security of sovereign territory, military affairs, economics, information, environment when pursuing national security with Chinese characteristics. Now, keeping track of all these requires centralized decision making, which she firmly in charge. And the Chinese national security law enacted in 2015 helped to clarify what it means by its core interests, which boils down to the principle of sovereignty and defending territorial integrity. In addition to Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, foreign policy officials made it clear that Beijing now regards South China Sea and the Japanese held Senkaku Islands as core interests. Someday, Southern Tibet or Arunachal Pradesh may even be added to this list since it seems to be expansive. Uh, so what we have here is uh, actually a securitization, a militarization of internal and external policy and the lack of a distinction between them. Internally, secondly, internally as China's got more complex to govern, CCP legitimacy is increasingly dependent on nationalism. Uh, and that seems to push China's leadership to ultra-nationalist assertion abroad. Uh, as I said, all these flashpoints and hot, hot spots along China's periphery. Uh, China, it's the pattern of China's growth, the, the manner in which she has grown, her rapid grown, uh, the the high investment rates, rapid industrialization, urbanization, which of course have created short-term problems with bubbles and so on, I won't go into that. But in the longer term, it, China now has to repair major ecological damage to the environment, income and other inequality has grown, her society and economy are less responsive to government and she now apparently displays systemic, social, and political inability to, to reform, to change. Uh, so there are internal stresses caused by China's pattern of development. Uh, ever since Tiananmen 1989, the Chinese state has explicitly prioritized stability above all else. One thing you have each year. Uh, since 2012, Command and control has been centralized drastically. And China has built a security state, an internal surveillance state, internal security. Uh, today, uh, the Chinese state spends more on internal security than it does on national defense and has done so since 2011, roughly the same time that mass incidents defined it as protests involving more than 100 personnel uh, crossed 200,000 a year, and the regime stopped publishing the figures. Uh, what's happened is the rise of China's middle class, which is a product of globalization, has made China harder to govern. And this new middle class makes a different set of demands of its government and votes with its feet or its money when it's dissatisfied. We saw this in 2015-16 when over a trillion dollars, one fourth of China's foreign exchange reserves left China within a year, uh, when, when there was a certain loosening of controls on capital movement. We also see social change in the return of popular religion, superstition in China. 
the rise of proselytizing faiths like Christianity. And these seem to reflect uh, a sense of spiritual emptiness uh, among the middle class against the lack of morality, the get rich quick mentality that globalizing and rapidly uh, growing China spawned. Uh, the CCP has attempted to co-opt Buddhism, which is seen as indigenous and therefore less threatening in not having an external focus of loyalty like Islam or Christianity. The exception, of course, is Tibetan Buddhism, where in effect they've, the Chinese Communist Party has told the Dalai Lama by law that he will reincarnate with the approval of the Chinese Communist Party, a very peculiar demand from a party of professed atheists. Uh, but all priests in China, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Taoists, are all civil servants appointed and paid by the state. And the rise of large, powerful business interests, some of whom the regime is now acting against, adds to the social complexity and the complexity of governance. So Chinese society has grown much more complex, but much less malleable than before. And uh, it faces the consequences of this every day. And its response has been since 2012, the centralization of power and the personality cult of Xi Jinping. Though there are signs of some dissatisfaction among the public and intelligentsia with both. But anyway, in a centralized decision making within the CCP uh, has also, and the securitization of state policy, have also made the PLA uh, role in domestic and foreign policy much greater than it was before. Uh, which could explain some recent Chinese decisions, including those on the India-China border. But what this centralization has done and this new way of working has done is to create a single point of failure. It's now all or nothing, zero sum, and no failure can be admitted because the, everything is now with the personality cult and the centralization, it is now the result it, it is now res the responsibility of the great leader. So you see that on the border, for instance, uh, this combination has actually led to China now treating all border issues as sovereignty issues, not, not as a dispute, which by definition can be settled by discussion, by negotiation, by bargaining, by some give and take. Uh, in Xi's defense, the Communist Party has been considerably weakened by patronage networks, corruption, and the anti-corruption campaign is very popular, does contribute to the party's core legitimacy. Uh, but paradoxically, the anti-corruption campaign makes real reform, particularly unpopular reform, like that of the state-owned enterprises, less likely, because frankly, it scares officials into inactivity or passive resistance. And the legitimacy of the party has shifted over time from ideology, from commitment to socialism, communism in the 50s, uh, effectively removed by the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution to economic growth in Deng's period, now slowing, and now to nationalism, to ultra-nationalism or nativism. Uh, this has two consequences. In external pressure now plays into the regime's need for an external focus to consolidate domestic support for the regime. Secondly, it, as we saw on the India-China border now, it's a sovereignty dispute. And there is rising nationalism, which is fed by a China's imagined past. Uh, the historical memory that has been constructed for the Chinese people since 1992, the patriotic education campaigns, is a master narrative of national humiliation. Of course, the narrative is older, uh, beginning with the Sino-Japanese War 1895 when Japan defeated Qing China to Korea. And the slogan, never forget national humiliation, uh, has been used by successive Chinese leaders since the 30s. Every day for two decades, Chiang Kai-shek wrote, 
Xue Chi in the top right hand corner of his diary, meaning avenge humiliation or wipe clean humiliation, uh, to remind himself every day. The exception to this whole national humiliation sense of victimhood was Mao Zedong. For him, this was class struggle. Uh, and for him, the CCP was a revolutionary, not a nationalist party. And nationalist claims would contradict internationalism and his attempt to lead the international communist movement and export revolution. Uh, if you look at the records of the National Library of China, it shows that there were no books on the subject of national humiliation published in China between 1947 and 1990. It was with Deng's call for patriotic education campaigns in 1992 after the Tiananmen killings, when it became clear that the Chinese youth did not know or appreciate the CCP's self-proclaimed contribution to freeing China from semi-colonial status and foreign oppression, uh, that actually this whole narrative of victimhood, of humiliation has, and Xi Jinping has adopted this meta-narrative as his own, linking it to China's rejuvenation. Uh, in the long run, of course, the problem is that this affects the way China deals with the rest of the world. I mean, it seems this narrative seems to actually justify bad behavior. But uh, the, the, and it is really the sense that somehow uh, state security, its place in the international order is, uh, is ordained and natural and that China should be number one in a hierarchical international order, driven by a very strong sense of nationalism, which then seems to guide certain, uh, some much of China's external behavior in the last decade or so. Uh, in the long run, of course, uh, the core political issue is not, you know, state-owned enterprise reform or anti-corruption and so on, but whether there will be a sense of opportunity and fairness to sustain the legitimacy of the CCP, which will require fundamental change and for which there will be have to be a change in China's development trajectory. Uh, it's, uh, this is what seems to explain the new economic policies that Xi Jinping has been announcing for the last year or so, uh, which everyone sees as a turn to the left, but frankly, is a return to roots also, what he expresses as common prosperity, dual circulation ex economy, a new stress on self-reliance and so on. But externally as well, China faces an unprecedented situation and is therefore reacting in new ways. China today is more powerful than ever before, but she's also more dependent on the world at the same time and than ever before. This is an unprecedented combination, something she doesn't know from history. Not in the Han, when she had to buy off the Xiongnu marrying Han, Han dynasty princesses to them, or the Song, when she was in a world of equals, or in the Qing, where she was powerful but independent of the external world, as Qianlong told George III quite categorically, we don't need the world or anything you produce in writing, he told. Uh, and because of that dependence on the world, uh, frankly, uh, international primacy is necessary to secure China's rise, to keep rising, to keep growing, or to use their words, China's rejuvenation. Uh, the, because China actually is no longer isolated or irrelevant to the world. I mean, she manufactures one fourth of global industrial production, largest consumer of several commodities products, consumes one fourth of the world's energy, 59% of the world's cement, 50% of the copper and steel, 31% of rice, one third of semiconductors. I mean, now this is a two way dependence which drives China to try to consolidate Eurasia while also attempting the transition to becoming a maritime power for the first time in her history. Uh, so, and she's a global power in scale in economic terms. But not all dimensions of China's scale have translated into either global integration 
Uh, and from a Chinese point of view, as she sees the external situation deteriorate, this interdependence looks more and more like dependence. Uh, McKinsey, I think, is uh, China World Exposure Index, which uh, showed that China's exposure to the world in trade, in technology, in capital has fallen in relative terms since 2009. Conversely, the world's exposure to China has increased, uh, which reflects a rebalancing of the Chinese economy towards domestic consumption. But at the same time, China's technology value chains are highly integrated globally. Uh, the, an analysis of 81 technologies in 11 categories found that more than 90% of technologies used in China follow global standards. And uh, while Chinese players have grown rapidly, they still import critical components, such as reduction gears for robotics, power electronics for electrical vehicles, uh, equipment, semiconductors. Her IP imports in 2019 were six times her IP exports. Uh, but this looks to the Chinese as dependency because they, the leadership sees the situation as having evolved negatively in the last decade. Uh, the People's Daily on, on April 15th this year had a long list of Xi Jinping's statements over the years about managing risks and the external situation. Uh, and his description of the external situation goes from changing in 2012-13 to unprecedented in 2016-17 to eventually become becoming profound in terms of the adjustment of the global balance of power by 2019. And very early on, the leadership understood that counterbalancing was underway and believed that there was little it could do to prevent this. Uh, from in 2013 itself, Xi Jinping says, and I'm quoting, dur during this NPC, I quote, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation can never be easily achieved easily and smoothly. The more we develop and grow, the greater the resistance and pressure we will encounter and the external risks we face. There will be more. This is an unavoidable challenge in the development of our country from large to strong. And it is a threshold that cannot be bypassed in achieving the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So in other words, while China is not isolated, she's trying to cut her dependence on the world, but she still depends on the world for her energy. And as I said, she consumes something like one fourth of the world's energy. For food, she's the only large temperate country which cannot feed herself for markets, for commodities, but for technology especially. And that actually means that China must attempt a double transition to becoming an externally engaged but internally driven economy because she doesn't like this. She's never been in this situation in history and doesn't understand it. And secondly, to becoming a maritime power after being a continental power for all of her history. Uh, for the present, China can act assertively in its adjacencies because she has, she is secure on land to a degree that she again has never been before, uh, which is very different from the situation in the 60s and 70s or in history when the people of the steppes threatened her continuously and actually ruled her sporadically. Uh, so a globalized China's internal needs today give her several reasons to push out beyond her borders. And she's, she's comfortable enough on land to try to consolidate the Eurasian heartland. The Belt and Road is her way of doing so. She no longer has to worry as she has throughout history for about her open inner Asian frontier. Uh, so China's task of building a continental order has actually been eased by the collapse of the Soviet Union, the division of Turan into smaller, weaker states where her economic power can be exercised, and by the retreat and diminution of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. For the most part on land, Chinese power is pushing at an open door, with the exception of South Asia, uh, where India too is a rising and expanding uh, power with an expanding definition of her interests actually. And in Korea, where South Korea 
uh, the US military presence, and even North Korea's nuclear weapons program now limit China's ability to shape outcomes. So overall, she's in a much better geopolitical position on land than she has been. And she turns to the sea as a consequence of the pattern of her behavior, of her development. But that's where she faces the most resistance. The first island chain is either occupied by US troops or by US allies. And her behavior over the last decade or so has actually strengthened their links the Japan-US Security Treaty, for instance, the Korea-Japan cooperation, the US is back into defense cooperation in old, older forms with the Philippines, and there is pushback, uh, the formation of an informal balancing coalition among her neighbors all the way from Japan, the creation of the Quad, etc. All this complicates her task of becoming a maritime power and feeling secure about the sea lanes, which today are so critical to her because of the pattern of her growth. So can she make this transition? The fact that it's unprecedented doesn't mean she cannot succeed, but whether she does depends not just on her effort, but on what other powers do. Uh, and to my mind, there are several constraints on this. Uh, demography, all the traditional ones you know, uh, what we have seen instead now is the opposite problem. Domestic needs of legitimization, of inequality, uh, have prompted Xi Jinping to turn left, common prosperity, dual circulation, etc. But all these suggest a further turning inward by China under Xi and a return to earlier ways of mobilizing the party in society and of managing the market economy. Whereas China's need for the world, and the, if she wants to keep growing, if she wants to continue and actually achieve developed status as the China dream says, require her to engage abroad. Uh, and therefore you have a tension today between where she, where her society would like her to go and what the regime will need to do uh, in terms of dealing with the rest of the world. The problem of course is that, uh, you know, she's China dream is a parochial vision and this China model that he speaks of, uh, it, uh, China was a success when she was flexible and experimental when she crossed the river feeling the stones underfoot, as Deng used to say. Not when she followed a set model, as Mao did, and she seems to want to. Uh, so it's hard to say where these internal factors are going to lead China's external behavior. But it's certainly true that uh, it's unlikely that because her changed behavior over the last decade or so, her much more assertive behavior is based on strong internal factors and developments uh, and is probably driven by them, some of which I've tried to mention. Uh, it's unlikely that this is going to change very soon. Uh, does this logic work in specific cases? I mean, can you take, for instance, the India-China crisis since 2020? And can you apply this kind of logic to uh, certainly up to an extent, China's framing of the crisis as a sovereignty dispute rather than as a border dispute, which can be solved by give and take, makes it much harder to settle. It also suggests that the issue for China is not just about the LAC or its clarification or straightening or local tactical military goals. Uh, it's, it actually serves much larger political goals and some domestic need, because otherwise, why the timing? because all the other external reasons that one can think about, uh, the so-called triggers, all existed before as well. It's not as though they were new in spring 2020, but spring 2020 was when China itself was going through an internal uh, reordering, political reordering, thanks to the effects of COVID, external pressure, the world was blaming China. Uh, and it also, to my mind, argues for a, as I said, an increased role of the PLA in Chinese decision-making. 
And that once they were embarked on this course, this Xi Jinping centralization of power and his creation of a single point of failure and responsibility meant that there was no going back. There was no readjustment possible, and which is why we are now locked in a situation where 100,000 troops from both sides have gone through one brutal winter, but we'll probably have to go through another one uh, face to face on this border. And negotiations haven't actually led anywhere. Uh, so today you have a situation where, frankly, her ethnic nationalism and authoritarianism are both a strength and a weakness. Uh, let's see. China displays both great confidence and a sense of victimhood. I mean, she claims that the East will prevail over the West, but she also signals that we are undergoing the greatest change in a century. Uh, change is unprecedented in a century. So what does this mean for us? What kinds of, taken as a whole, they have four immediate effects. One is that, as I said, a reformed rising China is and will be more assertive due to the internal push to tighten control and the external pull of opportunity of need. Uh, the world now depends on China for global economic growth, Asia Pacific stability, and that dependence is mutual. And if China is a global economic player, she also needs the world for her own growth. She will push in the maritime space, and that will be contended by those who see the rise of China as a threat, particularly the established hegemon, uh, the US. Uh, but in the short term, it seems from Beijing, at least, it looks like the harder Chinese line is working in their most important relationship with the US. They've got Madam Meng of Huawei back. The US is back at the table discussing trade. The US seems willing to extend the time for China to implement the phase one trade deal, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, an assertive external policy almost guarantees pushback and resistance. You've seen the Quad, AUKUS, uh, India has been pushed by Chinese actions into a much closer relationship with the US than we would have predicted a few years ago. Uh, the US-Japan security treaty has been strengthened. In the longer term, this could pose a problem. But it's hard to say where this will end and how this will, will, will go, who will win this race, whether China's building of hard power, other leverage, or the countervailing actions that it provokes. China's problem is that ambition, once revealed, cannot be credibly dialed back, as Bilahari Kausikan likes to point out. Uh, no matter how lovable, that's the word Xi Jinping used, the image that China tries to present to the world, it's the ambition to be center stage in the world revealed in his own statements and state actions that the world will now respond to and deal with. Uh, we will hedge against it, balance, whatever, bandwagon, some. Uh, the third consequence of an internally driven foreign policy, rather than one influenced by an objective appreciation of external conditions, is of course wolf warrior diplomacy, but more than that, an inability to compromise or appreciate and adjust to others' interests or different perspectives. This makes it hard for other countries to see a place for themselves in a China-centered ordering of the region or the world. Uh, thus, what Lutwak calls great power autism, which he sees in both Chinese and US behavior. There are signs that thinking Chinese are beginning to worry about this problem. Uh, at the NPC this year, a uh, uh, former vice president of the Central Party School had a warning that the country should uh, actively and prudently handle relations with major countries, prevent the rise of domestic population, etc. cetera. Uh, and Several Chinese officials, academics have warned that the rise in nationalism could backfire both in the nation and abroad. And of course, the last is quite clear in Chinese behavior. The last consequence of this, these internal shifts is the overemphasis on China's security interests, their expanding definition and the increasing reliance on the use and threat, and use, threat of use of force in the pursuit of China's objectives. China has been so far successful and skillful in militarizing her periphery, expanding her military footprint, 
without provoking kinetic responses, staying below the threshold of provoking a conventional military response. In the East China Sea, South China Sea, and the India-China LAC in 2020. But on present trends, one, one must wonder how long this can continue without miscalculation. Uh, so I'm afraid this line of argument, this logic, uh, is not very reassuring. Uh, the only reassurance I can hold out to you is that the normal laws of physics, economics, and politics do apply in China as well. The joy, of course, is in seeing how they do so and how differently, as you all know. Thank you. Thank you very much for the honor of speaking to you and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Ambassador Menon, for the keynote address and for sharing your thoughts on the issues that drive China's behavior today. Let me now invite Professor Vijit Banerjee, co-convener of the 14th AICCS, and Professor China Bhavan, Mishubharti University, to deliver the vote of thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Lisa. Respected Vice Chancellor, Mishubharti University, Professor Vidhu Chakravarti, Ambassador Shivsankar Menon, Chairman, Advisory Board, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, and Visiting Professor of International Relations, Ashoka University, Ambassador Ashok K. Kantha, Director, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Peter Rimele, Resident Representative, Conrad Adenior Stiftung, India Office, New Delhi. Professor Shabari Mitro, Convener, 14th AICCS, and Professor, Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Johala Nehru University, and Honorary Fellow, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Dignitaries, Indian and foreign scholars, participants, media representative. It is my privilege to deliver the vote of thanks for the inaugural session of the 14th All India Conference of China Studies, jointly organized by Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, China Bhavan Vishwavarti University in partnership with Konrad Adenior Stiftung. China Bhavan in the last 10 years have been successfully organizing many national and international conferences with the objective of promoting Chinese teaching and research in India. China Bhavan is fortunate to be associated with ICS in many of its endeavors. The 14th AICCS has three key characteristics. It covers a very broad spectrum of subjects and debates. Most important, it is truly contemporary. Its participants are equally diverse. The diversity addresses all yardsticks, whether of geography, demography, gender, or interest. Three, the platform brings together scholars who you may not commonly find at the same location at the same time. The exchange of perspective that this allows could possibly grow into something more with the passage of time. So having underlined the progress made so far, let me recognize all those who have made it possible. First, I convey my deep regards and hearty thanks to our respected Vice Chancellor for addressing the inaugural ceremony. We are greatly encouraged by his presence and immensely benefited by his address. He has always supported us in the various activities of the department. I express my thanks to Ambassador Ashok K. Kantha, Director, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, for his opening remarks and his guiding ideas in the organization of this conference. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Ambassador Shivsankar Menon for his keynote speech. Thank you, sir, for your very interesting and thought-provoking address. I am sure that all the participants have taken note of your suggestions and will be discussing within them the action to be initiated at that level. I also extend my thanks to Peter Rimele, resident representative, Conrad Adenior Stiftung, for his remarks and for the cooperation and support extended by CAS. A big thank you to Professor Shabri Mitro, Professor JNU, and convener, 14th ICCS, for her unremitting efforts and guidance she has extended to all of us towards successfully organizing this conference and making a linkage between the Institute of Chinese Studies and China Bhavan. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to all the distinguished members of Institute of Chinese Studies, research faculty and administrative staff of ICS, the technical team of Institute of Chinese Studies and Vishwabharati for their perfect logistic support for making the conference successful. Our thanks to Registrar Accounts Office, Audit Office, Finance Office, and Computer Section, and other offices of the University Administration for their continuous support. 
in making this conference successful. We are extremely grateful to the Coordination Division, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, for providing all the necessary support in organizing the conference. I will also like to thank the chairman of the different sessions of the conference, the speakers within and outside India, the panelists and discussants to be with us for these three days. I must thank the rapporteurs, including faculty and students of China Bhavan, Institute of Chinese Studies, Johala Nehru University and Central University of Jharkhand for such an appreciating involvement and the willingness they have expressed to compile reports of the conference procedure. I also wish to thank all my colleagues and students of China Bhavan who are indeed the real assets and have made everything possible due to their exemplary cooperation and participation. So ladies and gentlemen, you would all agree that we made a great start, a very thoughtful start with this opening session. Finally, may I thank you all to have been with us and invite you to join us for the remaining part of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Let me conclude the inaugural section by thanking our esteemed panelists, Ambassador Shushankar Menon, Professor Dibhu Chakravarti, Mr. Peter Rimelli, Ambassador Shokantha, Professor Shabri Mitra, and Professor Abhijit Banerjee for, for joining us. I would also like to thank our media partners, The Print, for covering our session. The video recordings of all our sessions will be available on our ICS YouTube channel. We shall now break for lunch and resume at 2.30 for our first special panel on the topic, Family Dynamics in the 21st Century Chinese Society. Please note that the same meeting link is valid for all the sessions.